Thank you, Madam President. I rise today to discuss yet another one of the consequences of this President's failed policies, and that is out-of-control crime. Many Democrats have championed a soft-on-crime agenda that has contributed to soaring crime rates. According to the Major Cities Chiefs Association, since 2019, violent crime is up 26 percent, aggravated assault is up 34 percent, and homicides are up a staggering 43 percent. This is not only unacceptable, it's terrifying. Repeated calls to defund the police for open borders and reduce sentencing or bail requirements has led to a crime increase so overwhelming that America's fear regarding crime in their communities is at a 50-year high. Though President Biden bears ultimate responsibility here, in many ways, he's following the direction of his party when it comes to crime. We've seen a lack of leadership from the White House, an overly politicized Department of Justice, and district attorneys who refuse to prosecute crimes. The Biden administration has insisted on nominating radical soft on crime advocates to federal judgeships. While this is an utter disregard to law and order, it's deeply concerning. And it's a trend that we've seen over the last two years. Despite previous efforts to defund the police, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are now walking back their claims that less law enforcement makes us safer. As many Democrat-led cities across the country heeded these calls, the United States experienced the biggest rise in murder since the start of national record-keeping in 1960. On top of this, we are experiencing record numbers of police officers who are quitting their profession or they're heading for retirement. Seattle has lost more than one quarter of its police force in the last two and a half years. Just a short drive from here in D.C. in Fairfax County, Virginia, their police chief declared a personnel emergency, uh, emergency and staff shortage last June and installed mandatory overtime to keep their communities protected. Small communities across this country have seen their entire police force quit all at once. And perhaps very alarming, New York, the New York City Police Department saw 37 and one police officers retire or resign in 2021, excuse me, 2022. That's the most since 9-11. You know, my small state of West Virginia, my home state, is not exempt from these challenges as well. In 2021, the Morgantown Police Department began dealing with a 20% reduction in staffing. Our police chief said this was due to the danger associated with being an officer and an overall, overall growing stigma of officers being aggressive or biased. The West Virginia University Police Department is experiencing a simu similar shortage with a turnover rate that is still much higher than it was previous to the pandemic. I live in Charleston, West Virginia. The Charleston Police Department has been offering large financial incentives to attract officers they desperately need. And the pride of West Virginia, our West Virginia State Police, continues to struggle to keep our state troopers. We rely on our police for a multitude of services and protection. And in this era of out-of-control crime, we cannot afford these shortages to continue. On top of all this, the border crisis continues to fuel the fire of crime and spread illicit narcotics in our communities. Last year, we, set, we seized almost 15,000 pounds of fentanyl at our border. Well, in this first quarter, we have already seized 12 and a half thousand pounds just this fiscal year. That's only in a quarter of a year. I see the ramifications of Biden's border crisis in my state, which is disproportionately impacted by the fentanyl and addiction crisis. In 2022, we sadly lost 1,135 West Virginians to overdoses. We have the highest rate of overdose deaths per capita than any other state in the union. There were 6,916 emergency room visits related to overdoses, with our EMS teams responding to another 9,205 suspected overdose calls. Last week in Wheeling, West Virginia, local prosecutors indicted 
drug traffickers that served as one of the largest suppliers of illicit substances to West Virginia, according to our U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District. And I congratulate uh, Bill Eilenfeld, who is the U.S. Uh, attorney in that office. There was an original drug bust last October that recovered approximately 75 pounds of cocaine, 19 pounds of methamphetamine, and nearly 5 pounds of fentanyl, which is very lethal in very small doses. Investigators found that these traffickers had drugs shipped from the U.S.-Mexico border to Ohio via tractor trailer, or they used cash payments for people who flew from California to the Pittsburgh International Airport. The connection between the crisis at our border and the drug epidemic we are seeing at home doesn't get any clearer than that. Here in our nation's capital, amid surging violent crime and police shortages, D.C. City's Council is attempting a dangerous and irresponsible rewrite of their criminal code. Reducing the penalties for violent crimes, carjackings, robberies, and even homicides as these numbers rise is incredibly tone deaf to local calls for increased safety and policing. This is happening right in the president's backyard. So I commend my colleague, Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee, for introducing a resolution of disapproval to block the D.C. City Council's dangerous and irresponsible Criminal Code Act of 2022 from taking effect. The D.C. Council's legislation is the complete opposite of what we need to control this out-of-control crime. While I've been talking about concerns for the types of crimes we can see, there are also increasing threats from crimes that could be described as unseen. These threats emphasize the vulnerability of our children, as recent years have pushed their lives into an increasingly digital space. Because of the pandemic, children are learning digitally and have more access to devices than ever before, putting them at increased risk for luring, grooming, and exploitation. The data here is incredibly disturbing. One in 20 children will experience some form of sexual abuse before the age of 18. That statistic increases for young girls, with one in five experiencing some form of sexual abuse before the age of 18. Ninety percent of child abuse victims know their abuser, and 60 percent of child sexual abuse victims never tell anyone. Well, I'm a mother of three and a grandmother of eight now, and this is incredibly upsetting to me. We must safeguard our children from things that no child should ever have to experience. So I would ask President Biden, I hope these statistics are a wake-up call. Now more than ever, American families are asking for law and order in their communities and peace of mind in their neighborhoods. We as Republicans stand ready to continue our push for solutions that make our country safer, and a stronger place to live. With that, I yield back.